Hello and welcome back to another episode of the Apple Guy. This is my Macintosh Classic 2. Uh, I bought this a couple of months ago, actually almost a year, uh, in October of 2018. And in January <laughs> 2019, I started noticing uh, weird stripes on the screen during the boot ups. And now when I try to boot it up, that's literally all it does. So just boot it up here. So as you can see, all uh, all the screen that <laughs> all it does is uh, display these stripes. These stripes or bars are caused by a faulty logic board, or more specifically, the capacitors on the logic board. The LE can eat away or corrode everything around them, like the copper traces, IC legs, and so on. The case itself is pretty filthy, and the screen has some burn in. It's pretty much scratch and crack free, but has quite some yellowing. On top of the yellowing, it's also covered in this nasty brown layer. It has these weird brown stains. In other words, the computer is completely nicotine stained. The vent holes are almost completely blocked by dust, or should I say tar. More on that later in the video. So my plan is to basically restore this thing back to its uh, former glory. But uh, we have three problems, I guess. Uh, one is, of course, it won't boot uh, due to leaky capacitors, um, so I'll replace those. Um, I'll maybe, yeah, probably also replace the capacitors on the analog and power board. And then another problem here is the accessories. So I have a keyboard, a mouse, and even a microphone, but they're all really yellow, yellow just like the uh, computer itself. Uh, so I will be retro breading all this stuff, um, and even at this point um, of me filming at this time, um, I already retro breaded the mouse and microphone actually using only the sun because yeah, it actually works, but it's just uh, way slower than using hydrogen peroxide. So I'll just completely take it apart, clean the case pieces, everything. And then uh, get it ready for retro breading and recapping. So to open one of these compact Macs, you need a very long T15 Torx uh, screwdriver, preferably a uh, one that is around 30 centimeters long. Mine is decently long enough, but uh, you really want one of those because uh, the screws are here in the back, and it's very hard to reach them under the handle here. I opened up the case and saw the horror inside. This is why you shouldn't smoke uh, around your computer. Um, the inside was nicotine stained and discolored and the fan and the vent holes were clogged up with a mixture of tar and dust buildup. Trying to get rid of this smoke damage and horrible smell isn't going to be fun. I started off by hitting the unit with compressed air. The state and smell of the internals didn't really improve much by using compressed air though. I continued hitting the Mac with air and dusting off the surface dust until it looked decent. But first things first, discharging the CRT. So sorry for the background noise, I'm actually uh, in my <laughs> backyard right now, so yeah. Um, so first thing you need to do before working on one of these is um, discharge the CRT, so I'll go ahead and do that now. Um, if you're familiar with working on old computer monitors or TVs, then you probably already know what the dangers of CRT are and how to discharge one properly. Um, cathode ray tubes and the circuits who drive them can store a big amount of electricity which could give you a pretty nasty electric shock or even kill you if not handled properly. It's not common though, most of the time the bleeder resistor, at least if it has one, already discharges it for you but you don't want to give it the benefit of the doubt. Anyways, if you take the proper precautions and know what you're doing then it's relatively safe. I'll take these alligator clips and a screwdriver and now I'll just attach an alligator clip to the ground block of the CRT and the other end to a flat tip screwdriver. Like this. Be sure to check where you can ground yourself on working on a CRT. This can differ. I'm only using one hand for extra safety, 
Slide the screwdriver under the anode cap or suction cup and there you go. No spark there so that means that it already has been discharged and now I can safely remove the anode cap. Well, the radio started getting overcast so I started heading inside. Once inside I continue taking apart the Macintosh. It's pretty interesting that this CRT was manufactured by Samsung. I started by removing the logic board. I first disconnected this hard drive power cable. You don't really need to disconnect it to remove the logic board, but it's easier for me to reach your ribbon cables after this has been done. And now I disconnect the ribbon cables. Here they are the hard drive and floppy drive data cables. And now all that's left is disconnecting the logic board power cable. And like that, the logic board just slides out. There are two revisions of the Macintosh Classic 2 logic board, known as Ref A and Ref B. This one here is a Ref A model logic board with the 4 RAM chips instead of the newer board with only 2 RAM chips. Here you have a Ref A logic board installed in the common Mac Classic 2 case without a label. I have seen some Macintosh Classic 2s and no not the first gen classics or older compact Macs but Macintosh Classics 2 that have the old familiar information sticker on the back instead of the engraved plastic like mine and most of the Macintosh Classic 2s. I guess they did this to speed up the production speed and lower the production cost. Um, I'll take out this battery, I'm actually quite fortunate that the battery didn't leak. Max from this era and all vintage computers really are infamous for having leaky PRAM batteries or even PRAM batteries that explode and destroy the board. I've seen a lot more Maxwell branded PRAM batteries leak and explode than the German PRAM batteries or the Teddy Ran ones, but I'm pretty sure a large amount of those have leaked as well. As a matter of fact, here's a video and a couple of photos of a leaked Teddy Ram PRAM battery inside of a Macintosh LC. Steve from Mac84 sent me this footage for me to use. He has a great YouTube channel and posts a lot of pictures from his Apple collection on his social media. Go check him out. So the obvious spot where we have a problem is the battery and that's where it leaked. So it's not surprising that that's where most of the damage is. So we can see on a healthy board that would look like that with a little battery holder and everything. Um, here that is just ugh, exploded and all exploded onto these chips here so you can see these are what the healthy chips look like and this is what this poor machine looks like and unfortunately that has moved down to here probably because of the way ma the machine was stored so if it was stored on an angle or tilted so this all collected here and maybe it reacted with some of the capacitors which were maybe on their way out but we could see uh, there should be two capacitors in this corner here and uh, on the LC2 we could see two of them there but here there's at least one of them is missing now um, I'm not going to chalk that up to a board redesign or anything like that I think it just literally disintegrated and it's probably rattling around inside of this machine that leaked battery also caused a lot of gunk around here so we see it on the fan um, next to the hard drive and actually on the label of the drive too and I'm, I'm gonna pull this up we're probably gonna see more evidence of that. The battery in my Mac seems to be one of the blue German made batteries. I first tried hitting the board with compressed air but unfortunately this only removed the dust and debris to some extent. Dust, tar and other kinds of dirt are sticking to the board. Traces, chip legs and just everything around the capacitors are badly corroded. Well, at least the battery didn't spill its guts all over the board. I think this board is definitely worth saving. So you can definitely see that these caps are leaking and bulging. Everything around it has started corroding. It's, uh, it's pretty disgusting. So yeah, we'll definitely be replacing those. Next step is taking out the analog board. Well, while having a closer look at the frame, I noticed that there was only one screw but two holes. I'm wondering if this machine has been opened before or if it's supposed to be like that. Here I remove the ground cable and now I'll remove the CRT neck or video board. I first need to take off this glue though. Take out this screw and now I just need to disconnect the remaining cables. The CRT connector, the fan power cable, 
the power cable that is supposed to run to the logic board and the hard drive power cable. And here's the analog board. Next to where the analog board was lies this monster, a nice clogged up fan, not with just any dust, no, that delicious mm. dust and tar mixture mm. build up, yummy. Anyways, I'll clean that up after I remove the CRT and front panel. I first removed the hard drive so I would be able to reach all of the screws, and then went outside to start taking off the frame. To remove the frame you need to unscrew 4 screws. They're a bit hard to reach so I'll use my long T15 torque screwdriver again. Help this middle lip a bit and it's out. Taking out the CRT is even easier. I'll unscrew the 3 remaining screws since I already took out the fourth one when removing the ground cable. And here's your 8K QLIT, I mean black and white Macintosh CRT. I can't believe that there's even tar and dust between the CRT and front panel. I took a look at the frame and took off this bracket. And again, tar and dust under here as well. Nothing new really. Now it's time to remove the fan. Again, nothing new. More tar and dust for me to clean up. Yay. I'm quite fortunate that I did this outside. I considered buying a new fan, but this one ended up working just fine. I'll do some more testing with different cleaning products, and here we go. The frame, fan, and white plastic that is used to improve airflow were cleaned up with soapy water or strong isopropyl alcohol, and now look like this. I also cleaned up the hard drive bracket, but I didn't took apart the floppy drive yet. Now, I did this for two reasons. The first one is my big brain couldn't figure out how to take the drive off, and the second one is that I didn't really want to clean and lubricate the drive at that specific moment, because I'm lazy. I did eventually find the screw hole that I was looking for on the bottom of the frame and took out the floppy drive. Clean up the dust, old lubricant, then clean the heads with some isopropyl alcohol, and eventually re-lubricate the drive with some fresh white lithium grease from WD-40. I use white lithium grease because that's what he originally used in the factory. Now we use a floppy disk to test it out. Now this is my only floppy disk with a teared or a scrap label. So don't worry folks, I take care of my precious floppies. Okay, looks like it's going to work. Now isn't that just beautiful? So now that that is ready, I mainly want to focus on the case pieces and get them ready for retro bright. Now it's time to get rid of those poo, I mean brown stains. I used normal dish soap, hot water, glass cleaner and a toothbrush for the vents, speaker holes and small case details. Retrobrite is basically bleaching the plastic until it returns back to its original color. There are a few different ways you can retrobrite, but the two most popular are the submerged in the water and hydrogen peroxide technique, and the technique where you apply a hydrogen peroxide product on the plastic and wrap it in kitchen foil. Both require UVA light. We're going to use the submerged technique today because I feel like a lot of people have problems with the other methods. 
If you don't massage or move the cream enough every 30 minutes or so, you could get a streaking effect in the plastic. Now, I'm not particularly interested in dark and lighter spots or streaks on my plastic. I also have to check on the pieces and turn the plastic content around once in 30 minutes or so, but I think that this is the safest and easiest option. I'll fill a big plastic container with hot water and I'll also add some clear hydrogen peroxide. You don't necessarily need hot water if the weather's good, but I like to give the water a little jump start on heating up. I covered the container with some kitchen foil to trap the gases and heat in, and there you go. You can see that it's working because of the bubbles created by the hydrogen peroxide. I'm also giving a light brightening another shot. While I did see an improvement in color, I'm still going to retro bright these pieces later on. While the retro bright was doing its thing, I started drawing some sketchy looking sketches of the logic and analog or power board. I also have to remove dust and tar from the caps with a small paintbrush so I can read the ratings. I then ordered new caps from mauser.com and have placed my shopping basket in a link in the description. This video was shot around a year ago so prices could have gone up a bit or down a bit and some may not even be in stock anymore though. Sorry. Back to the case, time to take out the rear housing, first rinse it with water and now dry the part. Yeah, this looks wonderful. You can definitely see the contrast between the front panel and the retro brighted rear housing. So it's morning now, I just woke up and just immediately saw this and this is just awesome. Um, the color is just, it's perfect. It almost, if not completely, matches um, the color of this inner bezel thing. So yeah, that's really awesome. One thing I'm a bit annoyed about is this line here. This is where the sunlight apparently couldn't hit the case all that well. And it's on both sides, but I don't really care about it since the whole case just looks magnificent. I want to retro bright the front panel too, but I'll first take the keyboard and mouse apart, so I can treat the plastic parts of those as well. I took apart and cleaned out the ADB or Apple desktop buzz mouse too, a couple of months before this was filmed. Then there's the keyboard. Taking the keyboard apart is pretty easy, there are 3 screws on the bottom and a couple of tabs on the top. I opened it up and was greeted with all kinds of stains, dust and most importantly, a ton of hair that got trapped under the keys in its 28 years of existence. Now that's history. Jokes aside, the keyboard is looking pretty nasty and will be restored. Same thing for the mouse, um, I'll start by removing these three connectors. I didn't really know how to remove this flex cable so I made an Instagram story about it. I eventually did get it loose though. They may look okay from far, but here's a close-up of the grimy keys. It's time to remove them. Something worth mentioning is that you really have to pull up on these keys. A keycap puller would have come in handy. The keyboard housing didn't look much better. Just look at these beautiful parts covered in all kinds of crap. It's a shame. I cleaned up the parts with soap and water and followed that up with some glass cleaner and IPA to get rid of the stains and get the pieces looking nice and shiny. The last thing to do before retro bright is clean the dirt from under the keys and between the contacts. I started with a vacuum cleaner and ended up blasting the plastic with water after I removed the keyboard's flexible circuit board. Much better. Now it's time for a retro bright, again. I always take the badges or logos off since I don't want to bleach or damage them. Removing the small apple logo from the plastic piece is pretty easy. There's a small hole under the apple logo. Take a thin screwdriver or toothpick or something and push it in. 
the Apple logo should come right out with a little bit of force if it's glued in place. Here I'm doing the retro bright process again. I also threw the mouse in there but it kept floating and didn't get a lot of light so I'll place it in a different plastic container. I use this high tech raw <clears throat> excuse me. I use this high tech rock to keep the pieces from floating. I removed the front panel after a couple of hours so I could put in the other pieces of the keyboard but I wasn't happy with the results. Back in you go. I took it out in the evening I was quite pleased with the results. That looks about right. Rinse, dry and repeat with your remaining pieces. I eventually did retro bright the keyboard pieces again and also treated the keycaps. All that's left now is putting back together the keyboard, setting the case aside and grabbing my soldering iron. Don't forget the Apple logo. The mouse results will come later. I'll now begin the process of removing the old capacitors, cleaning the board and installing new capacitors. The more I look at this board, the worse it starts looking. Here I first remove the ROM chips and the RAM sticks. So at first I made a pretty bad rookie mistake. I tried to desolder the caps by heating up one leg and then slightly lifting it up and then doing the same thing for the other leg. Not only does this take ages to do, it also lifts the vulnerable pads underneath. Unfortunately, I ended up lifting two pads. Again, keep in mind, this is my first restoration or recapping job. It still shouldn't have happened though. So I just cleaned up this area a little bit and as you can see, <laughs> it looks horrible. Um, I lifted one of these pads and slightly lift this, uh, lifted this pad as well. So the method I used to remove these caps was just heat up one side and heat up the other side uh, over and over again and just try and lift the caps off. But uh, that resulted in actually lifting the pads. So that's pretty unfortunate. So what I did now was just take some pliers and uh, rock the capacitors back and forward until they break um, and then all I have to do is just desolder these legs and use some solder wick to remove all of the solder. I'll solve this by doing something pretty controversial, taking some pliers to remove the caps. This worked out very good for me and I had no problems whatsoever so I will probably keep doing it until I have a better solution. Oh boy, I can hear their mad YouTube comments already. Just, just, just shut up man. Just, nobody cares. Anyways, my options are very limited because I don't own a hot air station and I'm not going to try to desolder SMD components with an iron again. I'll probably be investing in a hot air station in the future. After removing the old caps, I could finally see what has been hiding under those caps. Absolute horror, that's what. See, this is why you should really consider recapping every machine that's more than 15 or 20 years old. Some cheaper caps even kick the bucket after only a couple of years. First, desolder the remaining capacitor legs and now I'll add some fresh solder to the pads. Desoldering would have been easier if the solder was fresh, but this near 30 year old crusty and dull looking solder barely melt it without a lot of flux. I use a tin leaded solder with a rosin core. This is 60-40 tin lead mix solder with a rosin core. Works good for electronics. Don't use solder with an acid core to repair electronics. You'll destroy them. The rosin core works as flux so that's why you didn't and won't see me using flux in this entire video. I just add some fresh solder instead of flux on top of the old solder to help it loosen up and melt. This definitely doesn't mean that I won't be investing in some good flux and solder rig in the future though. And now finish cleaning up the pads by removing the solder with a desoldering pump and cleaning them with some IPA. 
I tested out the isopropyl alcohol and a soft toothbrush on this area before and started noticing a white powder. This is aluminium corrosion or aluminium oxide. Aluminium oxide appears as a powdery white or dull grey coating. Unfortunately, this isn't the last time that you're going to see this kind of corrosion in the video. After I removed all of the caps and the remaining solder, I started cleaning the board. Which took a long, 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 long time. The more I clean it, the more corrosion appears. I spent hours if not days in total on just cleaning the board with toothbrushes and q-tips. I eventually did get it really clean and the corrosion was a thing of the past, just how I like it. So I finally finished cleaning the board. Um, it really paid off, most of the corrosion is gone and in my opinion it overall just looks great now. Um, for now, I'll just clean the back side of the board one more time with a soft toothbrush and some isopropyl alcohol and then start soldering. The leaked electrolytic goo or electrolyte from the capacitors starts eating away the board. So you'll probably expect me to buy tantalum caps that don't contain any fluid that can leak over time. But no, while I am completely for tantalum caps on the vintage computers, I did actually buy SMD or surface mount electrolytic capacitors for the logic board. The main reason is because I'm a beginner and I wasn't really sure if I was doing the right thing by buying low ESR tantalum caps and the second reason is because I like the original look. All of these capacitors are actually better than the original. They're all branded caps with most of them being Nishigans, Word Electronics and a few Panasonic caps. Here's some information about the analog board. The original caps were all standard rated for about 85 degrees Celsius max. And I guess they had a decent lifespan rating or amount of life hours. But the new capacitors are reliable caps rated for 105 degrees Celsius maximum and have a good lifespan rating or amount of life hours. The new Nishigan SMD caps for the logic board are almost exactly the same as the old ones except for the three big ones. Those are a bit more expensive, have a lower ESR and should last a bit longer. I don't really care since I'll probably be replacing those caps again in a few years or so. Before I attempt putting on the new caps, I will make a little jumper for the missing pad or pads, as you see now. The vias on the PCB were just fine for this kind of work. They're really small so I had to use some magnifying glasses. I test out some of the traces and the jumper wire with a multimeter on continuity mode to see if it works. And that seems to look and sound okay, now I can move on. I'll first tint the pads. And then I'll also tint the capacitor legs before I solder the caps onto the board.
Now anyone noticed how I installed the caps backwards here? Well, don't worry, because I actually fixed that before I put the board back into the computer. Fortunately. One last clean, install a new battery and put the ROM chips and the RAM sticks in. Now we're done! With the logic board now finished I can start on the analog board. If you have one of these then you probably know this, but before you can access the solder joints you need to remove this insulation sheet. Most of them are pretty clean and are white, mine just happens to be brown because of that smoke damage. I first marked all of the solder joints that I need to desolder. Um, I did this with a Sharpie permanent marker. How do you call it? How do you guys call these? How do you guys call these? English isn't even my main language. Oh well. Alcohol stuff to... This is my method for removing true hole caps. Tin the soldering iron, heat up one leg and now pull one leg out. Then repeat with the other leg. And here you go. Old cap out, new cap needs to go in. And the last one. After removing the capacitors I noticed these brown stains on the board, mainly around the capacitors and legs of other components. My first guess is definitely leaking caps, but this could also be nicotine stains. I also got a lot of corrosion here. The more I cleaned it, the more dead or corroded copper and aluminium started getting off. A lot of isopropyl alcohol helped me out a bunch. Installing the caps is pretty straightforward. Putting them in, bending the legs so the caps don't fall through the holes again, add some solder, snip the legs off, and there you go. I continued installing the caps. Something worth mentioning is that I didn't just replace the bigger caps like some people do though. I literally replaced every single electrolytic cap on the board, including these tiny little capacitors. I had to solder a sketchy jumper wire here. Half of the pad came off while removing the old solder. I constructed a new half using stripped bodge wire. And I cleaned it up one more time. Now we can finally finish this project by cleaning some parts and putting it all back together. Before I put this sheet back on I decided to clean it. Yeah that's about as good as I'm gonna get it. Cleaning the CRT. While it does have some burn in, it still looks good. Way better than it did, that's for sure. Then I cleaned these cables, giving everything a last wipe down. I also had to put the mouse back together. Make sure you haven't accidentally put any capacitors in backwards. I triple checked this. And
And then I had a fully restored Mac Classic 2. Well, in pieces. Enjoy these next clips. I tested the machine out while it was still opened in case there would be more problems. So it hasn't blown up yet, which is remarkable. <sighs> let's go. Oh yeah, let's go. Wow. Wow, it lit. It did the sound. Is it working? Oh, that is awesome! Wow, the screen looks great. Oh crap! I'm sorry. That's my camera. Um. Oh yeah. Even the hard drive is still working apparently. Okay, that is great. Um now, I didn't notice some problems with the screen geometry. This is initially related to one of the correction magnets or maybe the neck board since it isn't sitting completely flush. I fixed this by twisting or adjusting one of the magnets and pushing the neck board flush to the neck or electro gun of the CRT when the unit was off. I secured the board in place with some hot glue, just like they did it back then in the Apple computer factory. I did accidentally break the magnet that I used to adjust the geometry of the screen. I also glued that in place. Well, this is as good as I'm gonna get it and I'm pretty happy with it, so yeah. Now this is not a tutorial, please be safe when working on CRTs. Now we're ready to move on. The feet decided to come off while retro brightening the case, so I just glued those back in place.
that is one happy Mac classic. And to be honest, at some point I thought that I wouldn't see this machine running ever again. Looks like I was wrong. No time for the fun part. Unfortunately, I don't own any games or haven't made any floppies for this machine yet. Feel free to comment some good game titles in the comments. For now, I'll have fun with my original discs and stuff that's already installed on old Bessie the SCSI hard drive. A SCSI to SD solution will probably come with time. But that's for another video though. Apparently the system clock only goes up to 2019. Oh well. Welcome in 2020, little Mac. Well, that about wraps it up. I hope you enjoyed watching this video. Um, I had a blast working on this machine. Well, most of the time. <laughs> Um, I also learned a lot about these compact Macs. Anyways, if you like this kind of content and enjoy watching these retro tech videos, consider subscribing to my channel and liking this video. And then I'll see you next week. Bye.